Hey guys, it's Max. Welcome to my long-term review of the Blackmagic external graphics card unit that was released about two and a half months ago. In this video, I'm going to be answering some questions that a lot of you guys had, including myself, in my initial video that I did shortly after this was released. And I'm also going to be talking about video editing performance. That's going to be the key point of this video, both in Final Cut, Premiere Pro, and DaVinci Resolve using a wide variety of codecs. And I will say straight up that for a majority of you guys, this is not worth buying. There are some better solutions if you need an external graphics card unit, which I do have linked in the video description below. But with that said, there is a small portion of you guys that are out there that this thing is perfect for. And I will definitely recommend it. So I'm going to be talking about my recommendations towards the end of the video. I want to start off with the external design because this thing is very unique and it is by far the quietest external graphics card unit that I have ever used. This thing is custom designed in partnership with Apple and Blackmagic and they did a fantastic job. Now one downside is that it is very large uh, even though it matches up so well to MacBook Pros especially if you have the space gray version but because of the size of it they were able to implement a cooling solution that is custom designed and it uses a single fan sucking in air from the bottom and then pushing it out through the top. Now another thing that is very special about this thing is the fact that it actually supports Thunderbolt 3 displays like my LG 5K Ultrafine display. So there is no other graphics card unit on the market, the external one, that I know that supports Thunderbolt 3 displays. One question that we had in my initial video is there is no display port output on here. You have HDMI 2.0, you have some USB inputs. Now after some testing, I am glad to say that yes, you can use a USB to display port adapter to connect to your display port monitor. And I will link a display port cable that I used in the video description. Now I think the biggest downside with this unit is the fact that you do not have the ability to change out your graphics cards. So a couple of years from now, if you want better performance, you're gonna have to sell the whole thing and upgrade with a higher price. Now onto price points, this thing comes in at $700. Now when it was announced, it wasn't that bad of a deal because graphics card prices were really, really inflated. But as a couple months went by, the graphics card prices finally went down after all that mining craze. As far as bang for the buck, you definitely are better off buying something that is two separate pieces that you put together and then in the future you can upgrade your graphics card. So for this review, I wanted to give the best, most accurate, wide representation of what this external graphics card unit could do. Because of that, I not only tested out the three different video editing programs in a lot of different codecs, but also three separate laptops. So if you guys appreciate all of the time, testing, and money that went into this, please give this video a like. If you guys wanna share it on some groups, on forums, I would definitely appreciate it as well and make sure you guys are subscribed. So let's get into performance, starting off with Geekbench 4's OpenCL test. I do want to say that I'm not going to be going over each and every single number because of uh, the fact that we have three different laptops. So here you guys can tell that we have almost three times the performance with the eGPU compared to the integrated graphics in the 13-inch MacBook Pro and roughly twice the performance compared to our dedicated graphics cards that are built into our 15-inch MacBook Pros. Those dedicated graphics cards don't perform very differently from each other because they are based off of the same architecture, the same design. Now let's take a look at Unigen Heaven, which is a gaming benchmark. And then once again, I just want to show you the raw performance. And here we're getting much better performance compared to the integrated graphics and quite a bit better performance compared to the 15 inch. Now let's take a look at Cinebench R15. This is a rendering benchmark. Here we get more than twice as good performance with a 13 inch. I actually got much slower performance, almost the same as with the 2016 version with a CPU that is much, much slower. So we're starting to see a problem here. Before we take a look at video editing performance, I want to give a big thank you to today's sponsor, NordVPN. If you're using a sweet custom build or any computer or mobile device, pretty much everything you do online can be easily tracked. But with NordVPN, your personal information is protected from hackers, malware, and annoying ads. This is really important, especially if you're using public Wi-Fi networks and accessing personal information. Have you ever traveled and not been able to watch your favorite TV shows or stayed home but been blocked out of content? Well, with NordVPN, you can change your location in seconds and have access. NordVPN has over 5,000 servers in 62 countries and is easy to use to secure you in seconds. It works with most operating systems like Windows, macOS, iOS, and Android, and for viewers in China, it bypasses the Great China Firewall. Bandwidth is unlimited and you get a 30-day risk-free trial. All you have to do to start protecting yourself is go to nordvpn.com slash 
And by using my code MAXYURIEV, you'll get 66% off a two-year plan with NordVPN. Now let's get into video editing performance. I'm going to start off with some exclusive tests with Final Cut, then we're going to move on to tests with Final Cut, Premiere Pro, and DaVinci Resolve, and then we're going to test some uh, C200, Cinema Raw Light Kodak, and Red Raw as well. Starting off with Bruce X, we get some really promising numbers with all of the laptops taking roughly 30 seconds if they're connected to their external graphics card unit. But I do want to say that this is no longer a great test to compare different MacBook Pros together. This test is now more like Geekbench Force OpenCL test testing your raw graphics card performance and not overall video editing performance with Final Cut. In this next test, I exported 4K ProRes RAW that is graded to a ProRes file, and we saw some really great improvements with the 13-inch MacBook Pro. Not only did it export much faster and actually slightly beating my 2016 MacBook Pro, but our timeline performance went from an unusable 16 frames per second, meaning it's dropping frames, to a perfectly usable 30 frames per second, meaning you can edit both uh, 24 and 30 FPS ProRes RAW on a 13-inch MacBook Pro, which is awesome. Now, unfortunately, with the 2016 model, I really didn't see much of a difference. It was a little bit faster, but I did get a little bit of extra choppiness in the timeline, which I didn't before. And unfortunately, our top of the line 2018 i9 model did actually get slower, and I noticed those same kind of stuttery glitchiness in the timeline. Now, let's take a look at H.265. Both of our 2018 MacBook Pros actually got slower with the external graphics card unit. Yes, the external graphics card unit was being used, and we could talk about the eGPU script and Mac OS Mojave after we talk about video editing so make sure you stay for that now let's take a look at video stabilization and here we do see some good improvement with the 13 inch macbook pro and final cut and really no improvements on the 15 inch macbook pros all three of the laptops got faster but that 13 inch got so much faster because resolve mainly uses the graphics card for this function so it can actually harness the power of the external graphics card unit and lastly, in Premiere Pro, two of the laptops didn't really see an improvement, and our fastest laptop actually got slower, quite a bit slower, with the external graphics card unit, and yes, I tested this multiple times. Next, let's take a look at a 5-minute 4K project with two LUTs and film grain applied, and with our 13-inch, we see massive speed improvements in all three programs. Unfortunately, with the two 15-inch models, we're either not seeing any performance improvements, or we're actually getting slower and in fact, like I saw some stuttering before in the timeline, in a lot of these tests, I'm going from no stuttering in the timeline and Final Cut to actually getting some stuttering and the overall editing experience is worse as well. So I tested this multiple times. This was using the eGPU script to enable the full GPU acceleration, kind of force it by software. Along with that, I do want to mention, I did do testing with macOS Mojave as well and the performance characteristics and the speeds did not change, but with macOS Mojave, you no longer have to run that eGPU script. You could just right click on the app, go to kind of the properties, and then enable external GPU use for that program, which is nice. But the performance did not change, unfortunately. I did, was kind of getting my hopes up with the new software. Now, if I were to speculate and kind of guess why this is happening, I would guess bottlenecking. When you're running an OpenCL test on that graphics card, it just runs the test on the graphics card and sends the results back. It's not really having to actively take that data and do something with it like you do when you're video editing. When you're gaming, it's just displaying that information to the display. When you're video editing, it has to render it on the graphics card and send that data back and that's where I think the bottlenecking is, is happening. I have tested some higher end graphics cards and we did see speed improvements. The difference in performance between these two graphics cards isn't that great. In fact, we're getting slower performance. So I would suggest getting a graphics card that's more powerful, probably the Vega 64. And I'll go ahead and link that in the video description along with an external enclosure that you can use it in. Now let's get into some raw performance. I'm gonna start out with 4.5K raw and I'm gonna separate Final Cut from the rest of the programs for this codec uh, because I actually don't have the full results for all of the laptops for the raw footage. But here, once again, we're seeing some pretty good improvement on the 13 inch MacBook Pro and uh, you're not gonna get amazing red editing capabilities with this 13 inch. Uh, it is gonna be possible with some patience where otherwise it wouldn't be without the external graphics card unit but I just want to mention that. And unfortunately on our 15 inch MacBook Pros, even though we do have a little bit of a speed difference, it really isn't enough to make a noticeable difference because the real bottleneck here is our CPUs. Now let's move on to the other two programs. And here I just have the top line 2018 i9 MacBook Pro. 
And with DaVinci Resolve, we really didn't see much of a difference here, actually slightly slower because the CPU is the bottleneck. And in Premiere Pro, we actually did see some speed improvement, but this was only with the render. Actual timeline performance, there wasn't enough of a difference in graphics. And finally, Cinema Raw Light from the C200. But we're seeing some really respectable speed improvements with all of the video editing programs. And along with that, we're not just seeing exporting and rendering improvements, but timeline performance as well. Now in DaVinci Resolve, we don't see as much of a difference in frame rate, but you do get a little bit of a difference, which is great. And lastly, in Premiere Pro, even though our rendering speeds are much better, our actual timeline performance is still not great. All right, guys, so now it's time for a conclusion. Just like I said at the start, I'm going to be saying who shouldn't buy this and the small group that should. So, so let's start off with who shouldn't buy it. Well, if you're editing with H.265, if you're editing with H.264, and you have a 15-inch MacBook Pro, even an older one, like a 2016 model, it really isn't worth it because of the bottlenecking and other issues, stuttering in the timeline, and worse performance if you have a brand new 15-inch spec'd out model, it does not make any sense. Now, if you're somebody who really can make use of extra graphical performance, like let's say if you're shooting with a C200, I would strongly suggest buying your own enclosure, buying like a Vega 64 graphics card, which is much more powerful. Now, who should buy this thing? Well, if you have a 13-inch MacBook Pro, you want a plug-and-play solution that's quiet, that looks nice, and uh, you just want to make it work, not have the hassle, you're going to get some really great speed improvements that are on par with a, like a 2016 or 2017 15-inch specced out MacBook Pro. And I think it's a decent value proposition, especially if you like the convenience of not having to mess around with anything. Just buy it, plug it in, that's it. Now, there is a small sliver of the market that I said this is perfect for, and that's if you have a 13-inch MacBook Pro, if you want something easy to use that's quiet, that looks nice and you're using a Thunderbolt 3 display and you want better graphics performance, this thing is really the perfect setup for you. And if you're already spending that much money on that gear, the $700 might not bother you. And in fact, that you can't kind of upgrade it. You're kind of forced to use this specific graphics card. But for everybody else, if you're buying one, and a lot of you guys don't need to buy one, do a custom setup with an enclosure and your own graphics card. Once again, I'll have links in the video description where you guys can go and check that out. So thank you guys for watching. This has been Max. Make sure you subscribe with those notifications enabled. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. Definitely go check them out. And I will see you guys in the next video.